This is John Peloso. We'll be starting the webinar in a minute or two. Good afternoon. Uh, this is John Peloza. I'm a product manager with Temperature Equipment Corporation. Uh, among the products I manage is uh, Toshiba Carriers BRF, that's Variable Flow Refrigerant. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is just uh, we're going to go over a brief review of the um, of the product itself, just to refresh people's memory who you know who have seen this before. And then uh, we'll talk about the software and give a demonstration of, of how to use it. Okay, what is VRF? Um, as I said, uh, VRF is variable flow refrigerant flow um, equipment. Uh, we move BTUs through refrigerant, not through the air. So in other words, we're transferring BTUs through the refrigerant instead of heating air and then distributing that air. Um, we can achieve, achieve higher levels of comfort. Uh, it's uh, a very good uh, means of zoning. Uh, we deliver only the refrigerant that is needed to the space. And uh, this, this is true of both heating and cooling. It's a great uh, system. Uh, it's very flexible, uh, easier to install than uh, the large uh, dimension ductwork. Uh, you just have to go through four inch holes or so with the piping instead of punching in a hole 12 by 14 inches, for instance, with a duct. There's two types of VRF systems. One is a straight heat pump, and you're in cooling or in heating uh, at any given time. So in other words, you can have cooling and you can have different set points within the spaces, but uh, you cannot go into heating mode uh, during that time. Same with heating. When you're in heating, you can have various set points, make your space warmer or cooler, but, but you must stay within that mode. Then there's the heat recovery type. In this case, you can simultaneously heat and cool different parts of the space. So the areas shown in cooling right now are, are blue. Uh, the areas uh, in heating are shown in red. So what we're doing is we're taking heat from the areas that are cooling in the cooling mode and rejecting that heat to other parts of the building. If there's an excess of heat, then we would reject to the outside, outdoor units. Uh, by the same token, we're um, you know, that heat can be moved from the areas that are that are absorbing heat. Those those units are acting as condenser uh, during that time. And we can go to the other uh, areas uh, to absorb heat with that with that hot gas. Okay. Primary components of a heat pump system are the outdoor unit. And that contains the compressors and other controls. Uh, it operates the whole system. It's the brains of the operation. The indoor units, and there can be various types, so we're transferring heat or cooling the space and gives us a very good zoning. And then the controllers, uh, those can be located on, on the walls uh, or in 
remote areas from the uh, from the indoor units, and we can utilize uh, onboard thermistors on the indoor units if you want the controller out of harm's way or just if you don't want people to have access to them. Heat pump systems are good for larger areas where you might have minor differences or moderate differences in cooling and heating needs uh, in that same space. With heat recovery, we have the same components that we just looked at. We have the outdoor unit, the indoor unit, and the controller. We add to this the flow selector. Uh, it's a three-pipe system, and what we have is a liquid line, a suction line, and a discharge line going into the flow selector. So it's a three-pipe system, and then from the flow selector, a two-pipe system, a liquid and a suction line going to the indoor units. Good applications for heat recovery systems are areas that do need uh, different modes, uh, heating or cooling during the same time, or you know, significant differences between the areas. Uh, classrooms, offices, assisted living, um, warehouses, uh, the office area of warehouses, and so on. Okay, how's VRF work? The outdoor unit, uh, we have multiple compressors. Uh, they're all inverter driven. Uh, and in the six ton unit, we have two compressors, and then in the 8 and the 10 ton unit, we have three compressors. Uh, compressors change speed. They're inverter driven, so they produce only the refrigerant that's needed. And then the segmented coil, uh, it, it allows you to utilize different portions of the coil depending on the heating or cooling needs. Indoor units were either rejecting heat or absorbing heat from the inside spaces. And these all have onboard thermistors, so you can use them with or without a local controller. Uh, the refrigerant is modulated using a pulse motor valve, and that adjusts to meet the set point. So if you need more refrigerant in the cooling mode, you get more refrigerant. It opens up more. Uh, something diff a feature of the Toshiba carrier system is that the pulse motor valve can turn down to zero. It has about 1,500 positions, and you can pretty much and you can pretty much um, shut it down entirely if you have an unoccupied space. Uh, that's pretty attractive for hotel rooms or other areas where you might have unused spaces. The flow selector is going to take either liquid refrigerant or hot gas and deliver it to the indoor unit. Uh, it's an on-off sort of uh, device. Uh, this can be located either in the space. Uh, it's very quiet. You'll, he you'll hear a muted click uh, when it's going from cooling mode to, to heating mode, but otherwise it's pretty much silent. Or you can locate it in a hallway. Uh, this would be powered off the indoor unit. It takes two-way single-phase voltage uh, just like the indoor units. Uh, but again, you can power that off the indoor unit as long as, as, long as that's allowed by code. And controllers, of course, gives you programming options, uh, set points, and so on. There's a variety of indoor units, as you can see, uh, duct, both ducted and unducted, uh, also cassettes, ceiling suspended, and high walls. These units come in as much as 48,000 BTUs. Again, here's the variety of indoor units and the capacities that uh, they're available in. Uh, most of these do have uh, integral pumps. Uh, the cassette units both do. The ceiling cassette has a factory provided but field installed condensate pump. A high wall unit, that would be one that you field provide. And then uh, both the slim duct and the medium static ducted unit have integral pumps. Here's just more detail on, on the cassettes. The high walls, under ceiling, ducted, and a medium stack ducted. 
This unit right here does have a factory one inch filter rack. And with this, we're going to move on to the software selection portion of the presentation. Uh, before that, um, I'm sorry, I was going to show you where you get the software. As long as you have access to HVAC partners, uh, you can get the software. Uh, this is the page that you would go to. I'm sorry, let me back up one screen here. More than one screen. Okay. Uh, what you need to do is go to the literature tab. Go to the search button. And here's where it gets a little bit tricky. You might want to write this down. In the abbreviated model number, just put in VRF for variable refrigerant flow. And in this case, we're going to go after all the documents. And we're going to choose just the current. Uh, this product has been in the U.S. about two plus years right now, so mostly all the, uh, all the documentation is current. That is, there's uh, no archived or obsolete uh, uh, documents. Press search. And we'll get uh, just short of 60 documents here. All right. Uh, these pages contain installation documents, uh, product data, submittal data, and so on. Uh, but what we're interested in is the software selection tool. And this is it right here. If you can see my uh, cursor, it's called the Toshiba Carrier VRF Selection Tool. Uh, as you can see, it takes about one hour, depending on the speed of your download. Um, but uh, we won't be doing that here. I've already got it on my computer. But uh, that's where you find the software. There is an instruction manual that you can get uh, from your territory manager or from TEC. Okay. So once you have it downloaded, you open it up. Uh, this is not the entire screen, but I have um, you know numerous pro projects on here that uh, I've, I've done, and some of them are still in play, so I won't be divul divulging that information. Uh, but let's go over the various buttons here. Um, let's see, file. You can import and export. So if you have a coworker who was working on a project that you want to import into your selection tool. Uh, he would export it to you and then you would import that project into the selection tool and vice versa if you want to send a, pro a project to a coworker. Edit. This is where you can move to the next step and we'll see some of those in a few minutes. You can create a project. That's what we'll be doing. You can edit it, you can copy it, and you can delete. Uh, the tools. Uh, we have the preferences. This is where you would do your settings beyond the default, um, your select settings beyond the default uh, settings of the project, of the, of the software, I should say. I have the display and unit setting. Uh, I've pretty much left those uh, the way it is. Design conditions. This is where you enter your weather data, uh, your indoor design conditions, and so on for local conditions. Down here, you can choose what controller you want to go with each individual indoor unit. There's a variety here. This is a programmable, programmable controller, the RBC AMS 41UL. There's also simple controllers that are non-programmable. You also do your default fan settings and so on. Specification check. Uh, this will 
alert you if you're exceeding piping constraints, uh, if your heating demands are in excess too much of your outdoor units, and this last box down here. Uh, in this software, we don't enter, we enter piping length, but we do not enter fittings. So in order to allow for fittings, uh, T's, angles, uh, L, L's, 45's, and so on, we put in a factor of 1.2, and that will give you more of an equivalent length measurement. These are the various units of measurement. Nothing of interest here. And then there's document links uh, where you can bring in other support documents. And then help just gives you the version that you're in. This is a 2.4.65.0. This is actually a little bit newer. There's It's sort of a beta version beyond what's uh, available on the uh, HVAC Partners website. Now, to create a project, we go to Edit and Create Project. There's only two required fields here, the project name and the customer name. And we'll just call this webinar. And the customer name, we'll, we'll just put DEC in here for now. You have a variety of other information you can put in here, uh, the created date that's uh, put in for you, and uh, building information, whether it's new, existing, or existing. Installation dates, if you want to project where, when that's going to be, commissioning, if you want to project that as well. Uh, who is the person in charge, put yourself in, or if you have a project manager, you'd like, if you'd like to put him in or her, and then finally notes. Okay. We put that in and now we save that project and it appears down here at the end of the project list. To move to the next step, we double click here and there's a wizard type selection and drag and drop. I've always used drag and drop so that's what we'll focus on today. Then you can save that. And then these are these arrows let you move on to the next step or back one step or to the main menu. That's what this symbol is here. We'll go on to the next step. This is where everybody gets lost if uh, you just forget what the next step was. Uh, you see a blank screen. There's nothing there. Just remember to go to Edit, New. That will bring up a system for you, the start of a system, I should say. Very basic. Um, here's the outdoor unit. We start at the smallest capacity, six tons. HT means that it's a heat pump type system. And if you want to change that to a heat recovery type, you do this, you click on this drop down window and you select SHRM. And that switches this to an FT. That is the heat recovery type. We're going to start out with a heat pump type system. These are the various indoor units that we talked about a little bit earlier. We have the ceiling cassette. That's the 3x3. Three three. It goes up to 3.5 tons. The compact goes up to 1 ton. The medium static goes up to 4 tons. High static is available in three, four, and five tons. Slim type, that is a low profile uh, ducted unit that you can use in uh, shallow ceiling cavities. The ceiling concealed, I'm sorry, make that the ceiling suspended. And then finally, the high wall type. Another thing I'd like to point out, uh, let's go back to the heat recovery type for a second. You'll see this box right here, it's not highlighted. It's inoperative right now when you have a heat pump recovery type, when you have a heat pump type system. When you choose the heat recovery type, it does light up and it becomes operable. 
we'll go back to the heat pump. Uh, piping, we have branched joints and we also have header type uh, fittings available. This one is avail available with four uh, outlets and this one here is available with eight. Okay. Uh, just to throw out a, a simple system, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do a building with, say, four offices and one large conference room. So you can add to either the top or the bottom component here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make this top component be the office portion. So I'm just going to click and drag a branch joint over here. And this box pops up, and you can see that we have two units, indoor units here now. And you can enter the actual length, and that would be from the branch joint to the indoor unit. I should say that that's this dimension right here. Okay, So what I usually do here is just put in a nominal 10 feet, just to give the technicians, the installers, some room to work with. And you'll see that 10 feet pops up here, and I was uh, incorrect, it, that is this dimension right here. And I want to do four two-ton units, so the scenario here is we have four offices that need two tons each, and then a conference room that needs eight tons. So we'll do our pi piping layout first. This may be a little bit different than what you're used to, but uh, some BRF selection programs have you lay out the piping first and then you fill in with your indoor units and other programs it's vice versa but this one is piping first. Okay and then finally that's our last unit for the office area. So you can see here that we have uh, no components chosen yet but we do have spaces for them. Now, what I'd like to do for the conference area I'd like to choose one of the headers. So I'm going to get down here where we have a call for a component. Now there's two different ways that you can add the, uh, the fittings, either the branch or the header. You can do it the way that I showed you or, you know, so that we could do, we could do this and drag it down here. Another way to add a fitting would be to right click, go to the insert, and here you can pick your Y branch shaping, Y shaped branching joint, your four branching header, or your eight branching header. I'm going to choose the four. Okay, and as you can see, the program brings up the sizing. Uh, this again being a heat pump type system, we just have a liquid and suction line that's um, that would be three eighths and one half inch respectively. So let's start filling in with our indoor units. All right, um, same drill as before. It's click and hold and drag it down. And the component brings up its own screen. Just didn't mean for that to happen, okay? So, if you chose the, rent, the wrong uh, indoor unit or one that you didn't intend to, uh, you can make a change right here. Uh, same icons that appear on the toolbar. And you can name them. We'll call this FC-1, Vanco Oil-1. And we'll choose a two-ton unit. Here's your description of the model name, and then um, under group control, we can have either individual, this would be each indoor unit having its own control, you can have a header, so I can name this one the header, and then make it control the set points for other indoor units. And then if you choose a header, you have to have followers, and so the succeeding units uh, might be followers. We'll leave these individual controls for the offices, that makes the most sense. You can put in your uh, required capacity here. This is what's available, 24,000 BTUs. I usually go a little bit less, say 22 on this size unit. 
And then your uh, sensible capacity, I usually go in with a little bit less than, than is available just to avoid uh, difficulties later on. So 15,000 BTUs of sensible cooling. And then with the heat, uh, as is common with uh, so many VRF systems, uh, there's more heat available than cooling. And so we'll just figure around 20,000 BTUs for each offices. Uh, this, this field right here, uh, piping length from joint, that is from the joint to the indoor unit. Again, I usually put in a nominal 10 feet if I don't have plans uh, where, where uh, I have actual uh, piping lengths I have to punch in. Height difference, we'll leave, we'll leave that around alone for now. Uh, here's the controllers. You could change to a different control if you like, but we'll stick with the uh, RBC AMS 41UL. Uh, we're not going to have a second controller. You can change the fan speed if you like. And in this case, as is common with uh, duct-free splits and VRF systems, you have a separate ceiling panel, and there's the model number of the ceiling panel. Okay. So now we tag this one FC1. Now we save and return back to the drawing. So we're going to do the same thing here and fill these out. I'll, go, I'll do this uh, a little bit quicker. You have to manage time. FC-2. Two tons. Okay, we'll call this one FC3. Two tons, 22, 15, 20, oops, sorry. Uh, different heat input there, just for the fun of it. And then save and return back. And finally, grab the last one. Okay, and if you recall back when we had that 1.2 piping factor, to allow for fittings, uh, the actual equivalent length is uh, 12 feet. Uh, actual length of the piping is 10 feet. Uh, fittings uh, presenting more, uh, more resistance uh, will make the equivalent length a little bit longer, just like standard refrigeration systems. All right, so that completes the office portion. Now let's go down to the conference room. Okay, as you recall, we have, oh, and let me uh, go up here one second. Okay, if, if you recall, we had six ton, a six ton outdoor unit. Now we have eight tons because we have two, I'm sorry, make that four two ton units. And that will increase in size, and it's actually going to bump up to a twin system as we add units for the um, for the conference room. Okay. So again, conference room. We're going to choose two-ton units. In this case, uh, it wouldn't make sense to have individual controls. So we're going to have a header. That will be the controller that will call the shots. Uh, this unit will be utilizing, uh, that, that will call the shots for the other uh, units. We'll call this FC-5. And we'll plug in our capacities. And our length and save that. Okay. Another one. Choose the capacity, two tons. 
And this one will be a follower now. And we're going to make it follow FC5. So FC5 will be calling the shots as far as set points go. Two more to go. This will be a follower again. And again, we'll be following FC5. Now the last one. Oops, and we need to make this a follower. Okay, let's save that. Now let's talk about this a little bit. We have a large conference room with eight tons of cooling in it, uh, set at the, say roughly towards the four corners of the room. Uh, even though they follow the same set point, if we have more people, say, towards the back of the room here, those pulse modulation valves will open up more to deliver more cooling to that area that's, that's, uh, that has more people in it. Or if there's computers back there, what have you, whatever source of heat. If you need less cooling up here, or by the same token, less heat, the pulse motor valves will not open quite as far as the other areas and just deliver what's needed. Makes for a very efficient, very comfortable zoning system. Okay, now let's go to the outdoor units. So we have a twin system, and as you can see, we have 18 tons here. So we have um, 16 tons of indoor capacity, and we have a selection value of about 100,000. Well, the max selection that we can make, we could put uh, 18 tons of indoor units on the system as, as currently configured. We can go up to as much as 125,000. 125% install capacity indoor units to outdoor units. Uh, if you're relying for the, on this mainly for cooling, that can work as long as you do have that diversity. For heating, what I'd like to see you do is stay around that 100, maybe 105% is okay. And the other thing that you'll have to do at this uh, juncture is you have to have the main piping link going from the Outdoor units right here, this twinning fitting right here to the first branch joint. Let's say that we need, oh, let's make it 30 feet. And then we have two other piping uh, sections that we have to worry about here. LA, which is from this outdoor unit to the twinning fitting. Let's say that that's going to be about three feet, and the shipping carrier does recommend that you go at least three feet on that pipe right there on this dimension uh, before you make a turn. And then let's say about six feet for the LB section. And the other thing is we will give this a name. We'll call this system, oops, sorry. That only takes uh, numeric characters. We'll call this System 1. And save. And back out to the diagram here. So that pretty much completes the first system that we're going to create. We're doing OK on time here. So we can save the project now. Okay. 
Now let's say that you had a you know a larger building. The system is fine. The heat pump system is fine for its intended use here. But let's say that you have a different part where you want simultaneous heating and cooling. Um, that would require that we create another system. So we'll do that. Uh, but before we go, uh, we can look at our capacities. Uh, we have uh, rated and corrected capacity cooling of 192,000 BTUs. If we were relying on this for heat, what I would recommend is increasing the capacity of the unit. So two things that can happen here, you can choose your force, your voltage. Default selection is 208, 233 phase, or you can choose 460. And these systems are built to those two distinct voltages. Uh, you don't need a transformer uh, for the 460 models. Uh, if you wanted to choose a larger or a smaller system, unclick the auto box, and then you have the drop-down uh, unit where you can choose uh, larger systems or smaller systems. Uh, just to make sure, okay, so this 9 here is the voltage code. That's 208, 233 phase. As we unclick the auto box, this opens up the, uh, the choice to the 460 three-phase systems as well, and that's designated by the 6 in the model number here. We'll stick with 208, 233 phase. Uh, let's say that we want to use a system for heat. We can bump it up a size, and this would be roughly a 20-ton system. It's a little bit short. Um, these systems, uh, down in low ambient conditions that we deal with here in Chicago, you derate to about 55% or so. So in other words, you're not going to get 240,000 BTUs of heat. You'll get roughly 110, 115,000 BTUs of heat at uh, 0 or minus 4. So just to demonstrate that, uh, we'll bump that up to a 20-ton system, save, and then back out. Uh, and so now you can see that we have 228,000 BTUs of cooling, which we'll never use. But since it's a variable refrigerant flow system, the compressor will just uh, ramp down uh, just to provide the cooling that's needed. With heat, now we have about 160,000, I'm sorry, make that, uh, it would be about 214,000 BTUs available for heat. And with the heating requirements that I punched in when we we're choosing indoor units, we have about 160 required. So we're well, uh, well suited to uh, the area and uh, we'll be able to provide uh, additional su sufficient heat, I should say, okay? All right, now we'll save, and let's go back. All right, so now we're going to create a heat recovery type system. New, okay, and this drop-down box makes it a heat recovery type system. We have FT here, it's, uh, the 9 designates 28233 phase, and our heat recovery, our uh, flow selection unit is now highlighted. Just to keep things simple, we'll go with the same piping configuration. So I'll add these and very quickly um, get this set up so we can do the same exercise over. All right, so that gives us our four branches for the office area. And then we'll go again with the header type fitting for the conference room. And we'll make this, I'll uh, we'll put 20 there uh, between the, to get to the conference room area. Click OK. Now, Two different ways that you can get the flow selector unit into the schematic here. You can either right click and insert or you can drag and drop. Either way works just fine. Uh, the sizing will be accomplished or be done for you automatically depending on the size capacity of the indoor unit. So. Just to show that, we'll go in. This is the smallest um, 
flow selector unit, the RBM Y038 FUL. Just to show you the sizing uh, being done for you, if you choose a if you choose a larger unit, let's choose a 3.5 ton unit here. Call this FC-9. And 40, 33, 30, and 10 feet. Okay. So right now it's showing 383. When we save it, whoops. Oh, I'm sorry. If you exceed uh, the capacity offered by that unit uh, and did that inadvertently, uh, it will throw up a warning like that. Now we can save. Now you see that this uh, model number on the flow selection unit changed. It went to an RBM Y0613FUL. Again, just to keep things simple, I'm going to switch back to a two-tonner just so we can zip through this pretty quickly. Oops. Right, next one, we've already got our flow selector unit in there. By the way, if you wanted to add room names, you can do that too. We'll call this uh, Office 1, just uh, to show that you can do that. Uh, Two-tone unit. We'll save it back. Now let's say that you put your indoor unit in, but you forgot your selector. I'll show right now that we can put it in afterwards. Now, if you forgot your flow selector unit, uh, you can add one, uh, but let's uh, stop right there for a second. If you had an area that did not need any heating or that you wanted to do cooling year-round, say a small IT room or something along those lines, you could just leave this with the two pipes. Uh, as you can see here, being a, a heat recovery type system, we have three pipes, seven-eighths, three-quarters, and one-half inch. We get and that continues on through the branches until you get to the flow selector unit. Then we go down to two pipes. So for three pipes right here, you could just uh, grab two of the three pipes to make this a cooling only unit. But we're not going to do that right now. We're going to insert a flow selection unit. And there you go. Okay, finally, let's get that last flow selector unit in there. in the indoor unit. And if, if at this point you decide you want something else, you can do that. Uh, let's pick a ducted unit. Uh, let's say that's some other uh, type of room. Maybe a small office uh, sweep with a couple of uh, areas that need to be treated uh, differently, uh, air-wise. Okay, so two tons. And let's see, we'll call this FC-12. Okay, let's just uh, look and see what's happening up top. Okay, so we have uh, eight tons of indoor units that we just added, so we're up to uh, eight ton units. Now let's finish up the conference room.
Let me make this FC-13. I'm going to make it a two-ton unit. We're going to make this the header again. And we're also going to do something, a little twist on this uh, when, when I get out, out of this uh, screen here. So 22. Okay, one thing we forgot here, our, our flow selector unit. So we're going to close this. All right, yeah, kind of a forgiving program. Um, all right, so this is one area. We can either have separate flow selector units, but that wouldn't be a very economical way to go and it would make you uncompetitive. So what we can do is here, we can insert a flow selector unit before the header. So we can be in either heating or cooling for this little conference room. It's not a little one, but you know you get the idea. Um, and but within that mode, if you're in heating or in cooling, uh, we're going to have the header unit call the shots as far as set point goes again. So we'll call this FC 14. I'm sorry, make yeah, that should be 14. And it's going to be a follower, and we're going to follow number 13. Oh. Oops, sorry, I forgot to make that two tons. BFC 15. Two tons. We'll make it follow number 13. And finally, the last unit. Two tons, 22. Okay, so there's our system. Uh, we have flow selector units on all four of the office indoor units, and we have one. This is a eight tons. You can put up to eight tons of indoor units on this flow selector unit here. You can see that we're up to 18 tons. If we're relying on heat, well, we do have to add a few things here. Okay, so we're going to call this system two. You take off the auto button, it allows you to, to choose other voltages or other capacities. So let's say that we want to rely on this for heating as a primary source. Uh, it, might, it might be doable. You have to check your heat loss on your, on your structure. And so we put in 20 tons nominal capacity at, um, at zero minus five or so on. You'll get about oh, 110, 115,000 BTUs of heating. And if you have true diversity, then that heating will be available for areas not cooling for heating or that are in cooling. Main pipe length, let's go another 30 feet here. Uh, let's see, it was LA is the short one. So we'll go three feet here and six feet here, and we'll save it. Okay. So we have two systems now that we've created. Um, yes, we do. And now uh, let's go to some of these um, some of these boxes up here. 
you can add a central controller. You have a standalone proprietary, that's the BMS SM1280 HTLUL, uh, that allows you to control up to 128 indoor units. So we could have that. Or we could go with LAN or BACnet. And so if you choose a BACnet, which uh, is pretty common around here, save it, back out. Now, let's go to documentation. We have about 10 minutes here. This is the, out, the button that you push for output drawing and data. Okay, and we can create this in Excel format, CAD format, or PDF. Generally speaking, I usually go with PDFs, but for the pricing, I go with an Excel spreadsheet. Oops, and this is okay. This is just a little shortcoming in the, in the program that they're working on. Now, where do you want to store this? I usually go on my C drive right here. It's just the way I've done it from the first uh, day that I had this program. And I pick the desktop, and you click OK here. Don't click down here. Click here. And so we'll wait for the, um, for the program to create the documentation. Okay, uh, we have a question that I'll address while we're waiting for this. Uh, defrost. Okay, a couple things. I'm glad somebody asked that question. When the contractor installs this equipment, it's a heat pump, so it's going to go into defrost mode. The uh, reason that we need to defrost is when we're pulling heat from the outside, the outdoor coils on the, on the heat pump are acting as evaporators. During certain temperature humidity ranges, say from the you know, low to mid 20s on up to the, um, oh, say the mid 30s or so, that coil is going to get pretty cold because we're pulling heat out of the air. Frost may form on it. Uh, once you get too thick a coating of frost, you have to defrost. And so what happens there is, one, we have to turn off the fan. We don't want air passing over, over the coils uh, while we're trying to defrost. Two, we direct hot discharge gas through those outdoor coils to, de to defrost them. They defrost, the water uh, drains off the coils and hopefully out of the cabinet. Another thing that you should do is mount the outdoor units on stands above the average snowfall, say about 18 to 24 inches in the Chicago area. Three, you need wind baffles. Uh, we turn off the fan because we don't want air moving over the coils. If we have a stiff breeze, well, we're going to have air moving over the coil. So you have to have wind baffles that go over on all four sides. If you have two units piped together like we do, those can be set as close as eight inches apart. So you won't need baffles on those two sides, but you will need it on the remaining six sides. And then finally, you should have a snow hood. And it's not called a snow hood, but you should have a hood on the top for, to prevent snow from uh, accumulating on top of the fan. Otherwise, somebody's going to have to go out up there on the roof and clear off the snow. So thanks for asking that question. Okay, now we just created the output. Uh, this is a variety of documents and it's in my desktop file here on the C drive. Oh, and let's see, I've, this is my example that I practiced on yesterday, so I'll get rid of, rid of these. Okay, so these are what we just created here, uh, dated 818 at 12.52 p.m. Okay, start with the uh, price sheet just to take a quick look at it. Okay, so we have the model numbers and quantities, uh, the MMY AP228, that's our 20-ton system, and this is a heat pump as designated by the HT, 9 is 28233 phase, and we have one of those. 
This is actually comprised of two 10-ton units. It's actually 9.5 tons. The MMY AP2404 FT, FT is for that designates that it's a heat recovery type system, 9 is 2A233 phase. Uh, that's comprised of two 10-ton heat recovery type outdoor units. We don't have, uh, we do have to cut and paste or get the descriptions uh, uh, typed in over here. I won't do that here. We're running out of time. Uh, the indoor units, we have two ton cassettes and then we have 15 of those. And then we have that one ducted unit that we chose, the MMD. The Y branches that you saw, that's uh, these two items right here. I'm sorry, make that the connection kits. Uh, the the connection kit, twinning kit, RBM, BTE14UL, that's for the heat recovery. FUL is for the heat recovery type. This would be a three-fitting kit. This would be two fittings because we have two pipes and three pipes respectively. Y joints, all, the, all those are sized for us uh, automatically by the program. We did choose headers for each of these systems, so that's uh, two pipe and three pipe respectively. I'm sorry, make that, these are both, uh, yeah, those are both two pipe because we put the header downstream from the flow, flow selector unit, so it's in the two pipe section. Uh, these are the grills, the ceiling cassette grills. These are the flow selector units. We have four of the small ones and then the one big one for that, uh, for the conference room. The BMS, that's uh, the central controller that we chose. That's what that's what these uh, items are here. And then uh, these are the local controllers that we have uh, that we chose, the RBC AMS 41UL. Okay, so that's it for the Excel spreadsheet. The report drawing is actually pretty useful. Uh, this is a, total, a page for the total of the two systems. Wait, I'm sorry, no, this is for uh, system one here. So we have to add 37 plus pounds of refrigerant to this system, and that's for two reasons. Uh, equipment like these outdoor units can only be shipped with a maximum of about 25 pounds uh, overseas. We have to top off the outdoor unit, that's about 20 to 25 pounds right there, and then you have to add for the liquid line and the volume of the uh, evaporator coils on the indoor units. So 37, almost 38 pounds there. There's a drawing. This is uh, piping and wiring. I'm sorry, that, that's just a piping, a wiring diagram I should say. Piping schematic, uh, this is very similar to what we saw on the screen. And now this is system two. We only have to add about 27 pounds to this system. There's your wiring schematic. And there's your piping diagram. Okay, the equipment list. This gives you a listing of all the equipment, pretty basic. And then, as you recall, I was adding uh, piping links. Uh, this, this, this document gives a summary for both the systems. So this adds up the various piping uh, lengths, diameters, and so on uh, that we had on the two systems. So we need 180 feet of 3 8 88 feet of half inch pipe, and so on down the line here. And the same information for uh, on a system basis. 90 here, 90 uh, feet of 3 8 and then same here, 90 feet of 3 8 just so happened to work out that way. Okay. Now, one of the more, we have three different drawings here. We have piping, wiring and piping, and then the wiring alone. We'll start with the piping. All 
Alright, here's our outdoor unit showing the lengths, diameter, piping, and so on for the heat pump unit. You can tell that because we only have two pipes coming out of the outdoor units. There's a legend over here uh, for the different size Y branches, 3, 2, and 1. And you can see that uh, the 3 is the larger, largest of the Y branches, 105 is the middle size, and then the small one, 1, is, uh, is for the carries the least amount of refrigerant. Uh, and just like any other refrigerant system, as you work further down the line, the pipe gets smaller. And then we have this one red bar here. That's our header. And if we have had a variety of headers on here, then we'd have a red, yellow, green, or blue header. OK? So that's a heat pump type system. System 2 piping, pretty much the same, except now we're showing the flow selector units right here. And we're showing the Y branches. These would be three pipe kits. As you can see, there's an inch and three-eighths coming out of the uh, outdoor units, inch and an eighth, and three-quarters. Uh, that's the three pipe sizes. And we show both the two pipe and three pipe headers here. Uh, but on this one, we are using the number one again, and it's two pipe, because if you recall, we put it downstream from the flow selector unit. If this header was ahead of the flow selector unit and you had individual flow selector units on these, it would be a three pipe header. Okay, we'll close that. That's the piping. Wiring. Let me view full screen mode there. Okay. With the wiring, we're showing both primary power. The outdoor units must be powered separately. They each have their own feeds. The control wiring, a little bit different. It's going to be single pair, 16 gauge, stranded, shielded communications bus. And we have a, a few different uh, daisy chains here. One daisy chain for the outdoor units. And then for the indoor units, you have another daisy chain connecting all these together. And that feeds that information, uh, refrigerant demands, and so on to the outdoor units you know, so they know how fast the, uh, the um, uh, compressors uh, have to run and uh, to provide the sufficient amount of refrigerant. And then finally, this last daisy chain down here, uh, if you recall, we had these four units controlled by one controller. This is the header, follower, follower, follower. And then these individual indoor units for the office area have their own controller. Okay, um, and that pretty much uh, completes the, the webinar. Um, I, I just realized that um, I didn't see the entire question on the defrost, but I think I, I addressed most of those points there. Um, the other question was, how often does it go into uh, defrost? Um, you know, it's going to depend on outdoor conditions. Um, you know, if we see capacity dropping off, uh, it might have to go uh, more often. If you don't do a, a good job of, of uh, piping, you know, let's say they have unintentional traps. Um, VRF systems are different. Um, you know, with conventional systems, we're used to putting in traps, filter dryers, uh, reverse risers, all different things to manage uh, oil control. Uh, with VRF systems, they put very little oil out into the system. There's oil separators. These are rotary compressors. They require less oil to operate properly. And so very little oil makes it out into the system. Properly piped, um, you know, it's hard to say how often it's going to go into uh, recovery mode for oil. Uh, but piped correctly, you will minimize that. So you want to avoid any unintentional traps. Uh, use hard pipe. Uh, that's the safest way to go. Keep your piping level and plumb. 
um, and that will uh, you know make sure that your system is operating, providing heat and cooling instead of instead of recovering oil. And that's pretty much it. I see I've gone over my time by about four minutes. Uh, I do appreciate uh, you you all attending. And um, if you have any questions, please call me or contact me or call or contact your territory manager. Thank you.